Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This week, a movie trailer appeared, which, uh, well, I really want to talk about. Not because I think it's a good movie, but because it, it poses an interesting question. Uh, the movie is Moonfall, and it features a moon sliding just across the surface of the Earth as if it were in low Earth orbit. So I wanted to basically show what it would take to do that. And, uh, of course, mock the movie a little as we're doing that. So this is a system called Universe Sandbox. It's basically a gamified simulation of the universe. And you can load up a simulation of the solar system. And we can select the moon and we can go into its motion and adjust its velocity. So that's what we're going to do. Now, we want to bring it down so that it passes just above the surface of the Earth. We want to get its pericenter distance to about 9,000. That means if you add the radius of the moon and the Earth, they do not collide. So I'm going to drag this down. Now, the initial speed is about one kilometer per second. We're probably going to have to drop it down to about 200 meters per second to get our velocity low enough that it just skims over the surface of the Earth for maximum cinematic dramatic effect. Now, the simulation is running in real time right now. In fact, it's running with today's date. But I can click this to run the thing faster. I have to remember, however, to slow it down once we get close. And once it gets close, we want to slow things down so that we can actually observe the destruction in extreme detail. The main thing that's going to drive this destruction isn't the impact, because you're not going to have these things impact. You've, we've adjusted it to make sure that doesn't happen. What is going to happen is the gravitational forces are going to stretch both objects, and you're going to have extreme tides, you're going to have stretching of the bodies, and... That's actually going to cause earthquakes on Earth, massive tidal effects, you're going to have water flows inundating the surface, and of course a whole bunch of other stuff that will really soak up your VFX budget. The moon, on the other hand, it comes off even worse. It actually gets torn apart as it flies inside the Roche limit. It'll have debris pulled off the surface, and it, that stuff will go into different orbits. Now, some of this stuff is actually going to go into an orbit that brings it back to Earth. So if I select the planet Earth and we drag this down so you can see the simulation. Uh, oh, well, let's do this. Yeah, so we can see the simulation. Oh, yeah, we've already had one impact uh, there. And, oh, just skimming by past. I'm surprised those missed. That was a close shave. <laughs> now, at this point, everywhere on the planet Earth is, in serious, is getting seriously damaged. Just... Not just from the impacts, but just by the fact that we have put so much energy into the system with this close pass. This, you have to imagine that this kind of gravitational disruption will probably move the crust and the mantle around enough that it will cause a lot of energy that's built up in fault lines to release. So you'll have earthquakes all over the world. As I said, that's a task for the VFX artist. So, look, this is not good. The average temperature on the planet Earth is now uh, almost 100 degrees centigrade. Granted, that is largely because there are some very hot areas, uh, while the rest of the Earth is merely wondering why it's flooded. The moon, on the other hand, if we select the moon, it's got very hot. And the way that is, is just the simulation has had a lot of the stuff that's pulled back off it has now come back and hit the moon and that sort of raised its temperature along with the energy released by the gravitational interactions the the tidal effects remember the moon io around jupiter it is kept hot by these gravitational interactions with uh, with the tides and in fact it's got so hot now that it is starting to boil and you've got like a cometary tail in this case i'm not sure how accurate that is but it does bring me to the question of how we would actually get 800 meters per second of delta V from the moon or to push the moon around. So if you think about it, the best rocket engines we have are the RL-10, that's a hydrogen oxygen rocket engine, and it gets about 370 seconds of specific impulse. So if you do the math on that, you would need about one quarter of the moon's mass in propellant to, uh, to fuel this thing. And that's a problem because it uses hydrogen and oxygen. So the obvious place to get that hydrogen and oxygen is the crust of the Earth. Well, sorry, the crust, the oceans of the Earth. Well, the oceans of the Earth are about 10% of the mass of the Moon. 
Therefore, there's not enough. If you took all the oceans on the Earth and converted it to rocket propellant and then shipped it up to the moon, you would not have enough propellant to do this. What you really need to do is find some sort of local propellant that is easier and more useful. There's not enough water on the moon to do this. There is another option is, is to use a higher, more efficient thruster because one of the problem with chemical thrusters is that their velocity is comparable to the escape velocity of the moon. The moon's escape velocity is about two kilometers per second. That means you lose two kilometers per second of your exhaust velocity because it has to fight against gravity. That cuts the performance of your RL-10 in half. Uh, there's other chemical propulsion systems that you could use that don't use hydrogen and oxygen. There's things like uh, aluminium oxygen, where you, you would take alumina found in the lunar crust, break it into aluminium and oxygen and use that as a rocket. But that is even lower performance. A better idea is something called the magnesium Hall effect thruster. And this is something that's been investigated. I'm not sure it's been built, but... I know that Busek, who make regular Hall effect thrusters using xenon and krypton, they've demonstrated or they've talked about this. With magnesium, you can get you know specific impulse of about 4,000 seconds. That means the exhaust velocity is 40 kilometers per second. So losing two kilometers from the moon's gravity isn't such a big deal. And with that very high performance, you would only need about 2% of the mass of the moon to do this. So the next question is, is there enough magnesium on the moon? And looking at the geology from the surface and the analysis, it does seem that there's probably enough oxygen in the moon. On the other hand, you would probably have to mine most of the moon to actually access it, to extract out the small part that is magnesium. On the other hand, if you could make a thruster that worked with pure oxygen, an ion thruster, that would be great because oxygen is one of the biggest components of the moon by weight. On the other hand, trying to run an engine using ionized oxygen is just asking for engine-rich exhaust. Look, the point is, it's not going to happen. But, of course, in the movie, they need it to happen. What do they do? They use aliens. And aliens are a completely plausible way to cause the moon to fall to Earth. They don't need to obey the laws of physics. In fact, if I had looked at this uh, trailer and been asked to rate it on uh, realism, I would have said the most unrealistic thing was having the space shuttle flying in 2022. Now, I've been working on the basis that it took 800 meters per second of delta V, but it turns out that because the moon is so far away, we can use something called a bi-elliptic transfer. That is a clever little exploit in the laws of physics that helps us get, uh, get a little more bang for our buck if we're prepared to take a bit more time. So this is just the Earth and the Moon, so I can demonstrate it. What we're going to do instead is boost it up to a very highly eccentric orbit, a long way from the Earth, and then we'll slow it down. And it turns out this needs less uh, delta V. So if I take this, we're going to push the semi-major axis and the pericenter distance out as far as we can so that uh, it's moving very, very slowly. And the most of this will take us is about 400 meters per second. Now look, I've pushed the apocenter distance to undefined. That means it's now on, uh, on an orbit which is parabolic or hyperbolic. It will never come back to Earth because it's exceeded escape velocity. So I need to slow this down just a bit until we get the apocenter to be redefined. And you'll notice the semi-major axis is negative in this. This is just a consequence of the mathematics modeling these as conic sections. There we go. That is an extremely highly eccentric orbit that goes out to 0.45 AU. It's going to take years to get there in this simulation. But the good news is that we only spent 400 meters per second to do this. Okay, and so here we are about 30 years later. And the moon, because we've pushed it out on this orbit, it's moving at only 8.4 meters per second. So it takes a tiny amount of velocity to slow it down enough that it will now pass very close to or hit the Earth. And it only took about 400 meters per second to push it up here. So there's a sort of basic rule. If you can do like a bioleptic transfer, then the minimum delta V to reach any target is the escape velocity, right? Because that's your sort of... The, the limit on this. So yeah, if I want to bring the pericenter distance down to the surface of the Earth, it doesn't take very long. It takes a few meters per second. Now, this only works 
when we've got the Earth and the Moon, because if we try to push something up to this highly eccentric orbit, as it's out so far away from the Earth, it will basically escape the Earth. It won't escape the Earth's gravity, but other planets' influence will become more important than the Earth, and they will pull it off in its own weird directions. Now, that doesn't mean we can't make the Moon hit the Earth. It just means that we can't use this very simple formulation. It's going to take a lot more math and a lot more calculus and simulation to bring the object into an orbit where we know that we'll hit the Earth. So here, it's coming back down now, and I have to be careful I don't make this happen too fast. The orbital period is 60 odd years because you've got Earth's type gravity. Whoa, and there we swung by. You see, I messed it up. But this is a simulation, so I can rewind it and we can watch the moon get torn apart again if that's your thing. Now, this isn't Hollywood VFX quality. In fact, the fidelity of the simulation is missing a lot of stuff. Everything is still treated as point masses, more or less. There is a type of simulation called smoothed particle hydrodynamics, which is basically a way of modeling fluidized bodies under self-gravity and close gravitational interaction. So the Earth can be treated as a fluid. I mean, after all, most of it is more or less liquid rock under the right conditions. And one of the developers of Universe Sandbox did smooth particle hydrodynamic simulations for his postgraduate work. And about 18 months ago, the devs of Universe Sandbox showed off some smooth particle codes. They, they weren't properly integrated with the rest of the system. I would love to see that because I would love to be able to crash the planets together with you know, greater fidelity and detail. And frankly, I'd be, I'm looking forward to that being in Universe Sandbox more than I'm looking forward to a movie called Moonfall. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.